And I was so frustrated because nobody was giving me any answers. Mm. And I looked at him and I said, if you know something, I beg you to tell me. I'm so sick of people not telling me what's going on. And he said, we're looking for leukaemia. Everyone, I am so excited for today's episode because it is one that I have been wanting to do for over a year. Now, you guys might remember, if you've been listening to the podcast for quite a long time, last year, Britt and I, we had the best of intentions of doing Lifer episodes. And then just the pure tyranny of how much work that there was at the time got in the way. But one we person, did we did, but we, did, we weren't consistent with it. But 2024, baby, we are bringing it back. But there was one person who is from our Life Uncut discussion group. Her name is Nikia Love. And at the time when we were talking about these Lifer episodes and really doing a deep dive in our community and understanding who some of the incredible people are, who some of you are, was something that we were discussing. Nikia's face in the Facebook group kept on popping up. And it was a beautiful face to see, but it was also a really full on story for what she was going through at the time. And I am so grateful that after a year of us, from the very first time we had our first conversation around having Nakia on, she's sitting here in the studio with us. But Nakia was diagnosed with leukemia and has a truly remarkable story. And her resilience is something that I think is incredibly admirable. And we're so happy to have you here today. Thank you so much for having me. It means the world. Well, being a true lifer, you know that we don't start without an accidentally unfiltered. <laughs> you don't get away with it either. Do you have one? I have a couple. Fucking give, it, give us the what? worst one. I was thinking this on the drive up. I was like, God, what am I going to say? I have two, but I'm going to share the most recent one. It just seems fitting for this story. I've been through a stem cell transplant and I obviously had no hair for quite some time during my treatment and I never fell into the whole wig thing like it just wasn't something that I would I embraced I was like I'm bald whatever let's Let's just own it (laughs) let's just own it (laughs) anyway this one particular night it was my first outing in like over two years and it was my girlfriend's 40th and I was like I'm gonna just have some fun and I'm gonna order a $10 pink wig off Amazon and I'm gonna wear it to the party So I did. (laughs) Anyway, I also had my first bottle of champagne in over like probably close to two years. And I was like, oh, I'm just going to have a couple of glasses and then I'm going to drive home. Anyway, I was uh, very naive to (laughs) what I had been through medically and how much my body couldn't tolerate the alcohol. And I had two glasses of champagne only over like a course of four hours, standing up, talking to my girlfriends, having the best night of my life. And then (laughs) suddenly out of nowhere, I was like, God, I'm getting really hot. And I walked over to the kitchen bench and I put my hands down on the table and I was like, God, I'm really hot. My friend came over and she said, are you okay? I said, I think I'm going to pass out. She said, what do you mean? I said, I'm just, I think I'm going to pass out. And in like a split second, I fainted and I woke up over like had been dragged across the floor by my friend who I fell back into his arms luckily he was standing there dragged me across the floor put me into a bean bag I woke up my leather jacket was with one of my girlfriends my pink wig was with one of my (laughs) other girlfriends I had like a bottle of champagne like that had spilled all over the floor hang on did you faint or did you Drink too much because they're two different things. Right? No, I actually fainted and I went to my haematologist the next day for a clinic follow-up and I said, yeah, so um, I had a couple of glasses of champagne last night and I fainted and she was like, Nikki pre-transplant probably could have handled two glasses of champagne. Nikki post-transplant? No. Not the wisest (laughs) idea. (laughs) Also, I'm just thinking about your poor friends. Like they're like, finally you're getting better and they're like, fuck, what's happened? My poor husband was at the party as well and he was like, all right, we're just going to call it Uber and like... Or an ambulance. <gasps> or an ambulance. I, I would have taken you to the hospital. If I knew your friend and you you had been through what you'd been through and then you passed out at me, you're straight to the hospital. But you just mentioned your husband, Dave. You yes. guys have been together for 16 years, Ooh, which is such a long time. Married for eight. Married for eight. How did you guys meet? School. Yeah. Oh, cute. We, we, we're, not, we're not high school sweethearts. We didn't... Sweethearts. <laughs> sweethearts. <laughs> we, we didn't squeet. <laughs> Well, I think we're they not, did a few times. <laughs> yeah. We're not high school sweethearts. We knew each other in school, but uh, we actually started dating. I was in year 12 and he was completing his fourth year of his electrical print apprenticeship. And um, yeah. 
We and then yeah, I was being squ- together squeeting at first sight. I was squeeting at first sight. Gosh, yeah. that's beautiful. Yeah, did you ever special. get the seven-year itch or did that just not exist? It didn't exist. I was in treatment or as in for marriage, no, because I was in treatment and yeah. I was just so grateful that he was by my side. When I first heard your story and I want to read something, I was just trying to look it up, but you mentioned before the first time you posted, not the first time you posted in the group, but the first time you posted a photo of yourself mm. without having any hair mm-hmm. was the picture that you put into the Life Uncut discussion group and – It was such a beautiful post because it wasn't about what you were going through. It was about, and I think so many people attach, we attach beauty to having hair, we attach identity to having Mm. hair and it was more around your acceptance but part of it was an Audrey Hepburn quote and I wanted to read this. You wrote, for beautiful eyes, look for the good in others. For beautiful lips, speak only words of kindness and for poise, walk with the knowledge that you are never alone. What was happening to you at that point in time? And why was it that that is where you wanted to share what it was that you were going through? Uh, Well, I guess if we backstep a little bit, we'd obviously, during my diagnosis, I'd also lost a child. So I was 16 and a half weeks pregnant and I'm comfortable to share this today with you ladies. And I would like to also thank you, Laura, because I had experienced a missed miscarriage at 11 weeks back in 2020. And I felt so alone. Yeah. Mm. And it was your podcast and the likes of other women who were brave enough to share their story. I actually listened recently to the Chloe Chapman podcast and she was brave and she shared something on her social media when we were in the COVID lockdown. And it was exactly like it was the time frame that I'd had my first mis- miscarriage. Yeah. So I was looking to people like yourself and people like Chloe and other women Mm. who were vulnerable enough to share their story and I thought I cannot be the only one going through this. Yeah, and you're absolutely – And I'm not the only one going through this. You hear those crazy stats and you're like one in five. You're like where is the one? Right. Where is she? I'm like where are these women and where am I – like I'm I'm, I'm a girl's girl. Like I've got such Mm. a strong love for women and my girlfriends and my – you know, my mum and my nan, everybody around me, my sister. And I'm like, no one's saying anything. Like, no, yeah. who, where, like as in who are... Like, no one's talking. Where is these four people? Like, it's one in four women or one but in five women. Did you find yourself as well, the minute that you put your hand up and say, this has happened to me, mm. the village comes out of the woodwork. It's like the amount of people oh, of who then say, Always. me too. Even my mum... I knew my mum had a miscarriage but I didn't know how many she had had. Me too. And she was like, oh, like, and it just never was talked about. No. So that was the start of it and I think – and then we went into COVID and obviously that was just a harrowing time for everybody and mm. I'm not – you know, everyone's got a story through COVID. But what happened was we – that solidified our want of a child and I was diagnosed with PCOS like when I was younger. Yeah. So I was – able to see a fertility specialist quite quickly. I think in Australia when you're 30 years old they have this rule around like you Mm. wait 12 months of trying to conceive naturally and then we go to the, you know, fertility specialist. And so, Nakia, why did you go straight to a fertility specialist? Had you been trying, after your miscarriage, had you been trying for a period of time and it didn't happen or did you just know that it wasn't going to be easy? Did you already feel like that pregnancy was lucky? Pretty, Yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah. So... My fertility specialist had said to me like, okay, you have PCOS. It might be hard for you to conceive. Let's like when that time comes, come back and see us. So after that first mis- miscarriage, which was a natural conception, we yeah, went to the GP and I said, you know, we are trying again and it's not, it's not coming to fruition. Yeah. And they referred me to the fertility specialist. Now, again, you know, all of the investigations under the sun – they, as they do with IVF, obviously. they, My IVF uh, specialist had a quite a holistic approach. He wanted me to experience natural conception or as natural as possible if we could. So we did all of those Which things. Which is also frustrating because you're like, I want it to be natural too, but let's call a spade a spade. Right. Like, yeah. And you're like, I'm here, let's like, not waste yeah, more time. Right. Yeah, and that's, that's COVID. Like, let's not forget that we're doing totally. this in isolation. Like, gee whiz. Anyway. Yeah, yeah you're like, we're doing the sex. <sighs> like, we're at home with nothing yeah. else to do. We've been doing it. It's Yeah. So we ended up after it was close to 12 months of naturally and like and and furthering like medications and all that mm. stuff we went down the IVF route and I did my first round of stims and with 
polycystic ovarian sy- like syndrome, PCOS, I was, <laughs> I was uh, able to retrieve 27 eggs. That's amazing. Which that would have been giant. Well, I, I remember I got 15 on my first mm-hmm. and I, I, I was like, wow, cool. But 27, 27. Yeah. It would have been really reassuring at the time. Right. Reassuring. But what happened with that is they, <laughs> as we now learn, it's quality over quantity. Mm-hmm. And I, having had um, so many extracted, they said, we can't do a fresh transfer. This is only going to be live. Sorry, this won't be a live transfer. This will only be a frozen. We need your body to calm down. We need to get your hormones back to baseline. You know, you're at high risk of ovarian hyperstimulation, which I knew nothing about. And then spent a week at home. And this is in September of 2021. And I ended up with very severe hyper- ovarian hyperstimulation that put me into hospital for a week. What does that mean and for anyone died. who doesn't know? It means that you have so much fluid in your abdomen and your ovaries that it eventually, for my situation, it actually ended up going to my lungs and mm. I couldn't breathe properly. So I couldn't get out of bed, I couldn't walk, I couldn't do anything. And I did end up going to the hospital and because of the time that it was within the medical system, oh, God. I was not able to breathe and they said, oh, we're going to admit you to a COVID ward. And I'm like, no, you're not. This mm. isn't COVID. My specialist, uh, thankfully, he was a wonderful man. He's a wonderful man. And he was like, this isn't COVID. We're getting her in. Like she's, we know what's going on here. Like, yeah. yeah. And, Thank and God. Thankfully. Yeah. But yes, a week in hospital and I thought I was going to die and I was on fluid and IV. And so 27 eggs collected, we got... 16 embryos fertilized on the first day you're like great wow. this is amazing and then what followed from that was me in hospital in COVID so my husband wasn't able to come in getting my specialist come in to say we're going to give you the call at three days we're going to give you the call at five days yeah. we're gonna, you know we're going to tell you how this is progressing and they deteriorate every day and they deteriorate every day mm. and he came in on day five and he looked at me and he said they're all scrambled. We've got three that we're watching, but they're all fragmented. They've they've all fallen apart. We've got three. We'll see what they do. Mm. Do they know why? Uh, just, again, quality. It's just what happens. It's just what happens. Mm. And I think with PCOS, you're probably less likely to have good ones. <laughs> you know, you might have a lot, but they might not be the greatest. Yeah. So they, they said we're going to – we've – yeah, we're going to see what happens. Anyway, day five, we got one. And uh, my specialist walked in and I said, one's better than none. And he's like, yeah, but you're here and you're going through all of this. And I said, it doesn't matter. You know, I'll take it. I'll take it. And then on day six, he came back and he said, you wouldn't believe it. He said, we've got another one. And I was like, oh, my God, we've got two. Oh, my God, he like raced up to the finish line. Yeah. And <laughs> I was like, oh, we've got two. Anyway, so we froze both of those. In November, after I got out of hospital, everything settled down. I was like, let's do the first transfer. So we we did that. We went with the better quality one (laughs) and it came back and it didn't even take. It was a negative pregnancy straight off the bat. Mm -hmm. January rocked around and I was, you know, we were kind of planning our year out. And I said, let's start with a transfer. Like we've got one left. Let's start with that and we'll see what happens because... Who knows? It might work. It might not work. But either way, we can move we can on, with move on and, and, and plan what we do next. Yeah, like think totally. of our next step, right? Yep. So in February of 2022, we did the second transfer and it worked. I was pregnant mm. with a little girl. <laughs> Life was great. I mean, I think after a miscarriage, you're instantly just... Yeah, you're so You're so worried. worried. Mm. Yeah. You know, I think relax and you can never it. relax. Yeah, you're always anxious. I would try, like, I'm pregnant today, you know, like that's what I have to focus on. Today I'm pregnant. We landed in the second trimester. I'd just gone for a fabulous holiday to Port uh, Stevens with my sister and my niece and my nephew, brother in law, my husband and I for Mother's Day long weekend. And you also, at that point, you just, as you tick over into the second trimester, huh. Your brain goes, I'm a bit safer now. Yeah. I can let myself enjoy it a little bit more. Yep. And I did. And I really did. I I lent into that. The the first trimester, I didn't. Second trimester, I was like, okay, I've started. I'm I'm here. I'm putting my nursery together. Like I'm starting to think about what, you know, what my nursery is going to look like. It was Mother's Day. We were excited. We, 
you know, we found out the gender over the Easter long weekend. It was all really exciting. And I was working. I, I sailed through that first trimester too. And I thought, you know, like, this is so good. Like, finally, it's my turn like to, yeah. to f- have some good in this. And yeah, it just felt amazing. I was doing Pilates, was doing a course at uni, was working, like just li- like just loving life. And I went away, had that long weekend in Port Stephens, came home. And then within two weeks, I just started to feel so tired and not tired like, oh, I just didn't have good sleep last night. I'm talking like I'm going to bed and I'm sleeping for three hours in the afternoon. Like extreme fatigue. And I'm waking up and I'm going back to bed again and I'm sleeping another eight. Like this mm-hmm. isn't normal. Normal. And I'd go for a little walk and I'd get to the, I'd walk my dog and I'd be like at the end of the beach and I'd be like really out of breath. Why am I out of breath? Like, why? And you'd never had symptoms like this beforehand. No. You just, it kind of came out of nowhere. No, it came out of nowhere. It just started. And I remember, I think it was about two weeks after that weekend away and I was in the kitchen and I was washing dishes and I just said to Dave, I was like, I've got to go sit down on the couch. Like, I'm like, I'm really dizzy. Mm. And he was like, yeah, okay. But And he was great. Like, he was super validating and he was like, you know, you're preg- but this is the problem. I was telling my sister's a nurse as well. And so I was telling people that I was feeling this way, but everyone's like, yeah, but you're, you're pregnant. pregnant. Yeah. Fatigue is part Fatigue of it. Is, and I'm like, yeah. yeah, but I'm pregnant. And I said, and I'm feeling this in my second trimester. Mm. I said, this is the time where everybody tells you you should be thriving. I said, I've never felt this bad before. I was 16 and a half, nearly 17 at this point. And he it was like, look, something's obviously up. Like, this isn't normal. Like, just tomorrow go to your GP or give someone a call. So I called my – I was a high-risk pregnancy because it was an IVF pregnancy. So they, I called my team. They said, well, you're before 20 weeks, so let's go with the GP and then if not the GP, we'll go to ED. Mm-hmm. So I called my GP and just by chance she wasn't working that day. I got through to another woman at the, another GP at the clinic and she said, look, I'm just reading over your records. I think – we should get you to um, ED. So forward, fast forward to ED, I go in, they do the blood test, they check my heart, like all the OBS, and they're like, oh, yeah, look, your white blood cell count's slightly elevated, but everything else looks really normal. And white blood cells can go up in pregnancy. So, like you're fighting an infection. So or you're fighting something. an infection. Like it's no, you know, that's no biggie. No biggie. But because I was having stomach cramping and they had continued on, they were like, we want to ensure that you're not having contractions or that you're not having a del- like a late miscarriage or that something else isn't happening. So they took me into the sonographer and she scanned and she said, what centile are you? And I said, oh, like she's small. I know she was measuring small. Mm-hmm. Like they'd always told me she was five days behind. I was like, oh, she's little, but like she's always been progressing and she's on track and it's all fine. She just looked at me and she was like, okay. But what centile? And I said, oh, I don't really know what centile. They haven't mentioned a centile, but I know she's small. Is she measuring small? And she said, mm-hmm. I was like, okay. <laughs> anyway, I started having these like these pains on the screen and she said, are you having those – like are you feeling that now? And I said, yeah, I am. She said, you're having Braxton Hicks. I can see them. I said, I'm 16 wow. and a half weeks pregnant. Why early. am I having Braxton Hicks? This mm. isn't normal. So I think because I was a high-risk pregnancy, they wanted – they would do they were being so vigilant and they put me into a bed and they said we're going to keep you here overnight and we're also going to have the head of OB like come down and review you so they did at 2 a.m in the morning and they they were like you're not dilated you're not bleeding you're not losing like there's nothing to indicate that you're losing this child mm. um, but we just don't know what's going on so we're going to admit you to the maternity ward so I went up there in the morning they walked in and they said, we can't treat you here, you're going to have to go to the Royal Hospital for Women in Sydney for further testing. And I said, okay, like, but again, still no answers. Well, at this point too, you just like, you don't think anything's really wrong. You know something's not right, yeah. but no one's really telling you anything. And someone says go to another hospital, you don't really question it. You're like, okay, they must not, not have room for me here. Or yeah, you don't overly think it because I guess you trust those people. You do, you do trust those people. So I was like, okay, we're just going to, you know, they're just covering all bases. They're doing their job 
And then he said, we're just going to run a couple more scans. We're going to send you back down to radiography and we're going to do a spleen check and and some ovaries. And I'm like, okay, this is weird. Like why are we not talking about the baby anymore? Why are we talking about me? Mm. While I was down there, a haematologist called and he said, um, oh, I'm just in the maternity ward to see you. And I said, oh, I'm down in radiology. If you want to come down, he said, oh, okay, I'll pop down. So he walked and walked in and I was having the scan at the time and I'm on the bed and Dave's there and I'm like, oh, yeah, just like being so naive. And he's like to the sonographer, oh, can we just add on a liver as well as a spleen? Mm. And I'm like, something's really off. He's like, I'll see you back in your room. Anyway, they, the porters wheeled me back to my maternity like room and the haematologist was standing there at the door and I was like, Hematologists don't like specialists don't wait. Around. They're not waiting around. Yeah, no. <laughs> They're not waiting for anyone. <laughs> They're busy people. And he said, um, the bloods that came in from ED yesterday, they've shown something a little sinister. We're not a hundred percent sure we're gonna perform a few extra labs, but that's why we haven't sent you home yet. And I said, Sinister, like what? At this point, I was so over it and I was so frustrated because nobody was giving me any answers. Mm. And I looked at him and I said, if you know something, tell me, please. I beg you to tell me something. I'm so sick of people not telling yeah. me what's going on. And he said, we're looking for leukaemia. Anyway, he walked out of the room and I turned to my husband <laughs> and I said, typical specialist, think about worst case scenario. Oh. <laughs> But they, that's what you would think, right? Because you're like, I don't get leukemia. Like that doesn't happen to me. Right. I, I, worst case scenario, like what do you need? Also genuinely, like I, and this sounds so ignorant, mm. but I did not realise that leukemia was something that affects adults. In this, mm. I always thought it was like a childhood illness. And I know that that for a lot of people are going to be like, oh, that's ignorant. But I it's just, not ignorant I at all. I just didn't. I, I've, I've always thought no, that. No, it affects children more than adults. Yeah. It's not ignorant. And but. so I guess like part of you would be like, surely not. No, right? When you say, okay, well, we're just going to rule these things out, mm. what happens? They do a blood test. Three o'clock in the afternoon, the same specialist who was the register at the time with an, my then specialist who became my specialist came into the room, the maternity ward, sat me down and said, I'm not sure what he's, like, what's been shared with you already but we're just confirming that. And I said, well, he said he mentioned that you're looking for something sinister and it might be leukaemia. And she said, I'm really sorry to inform you, but yes, you have leukaemia. It was three o'clock on a Friday and I'll never forget it. Wow. Yeah. What did you think in that moment? Shock. And I turned and I said, she said, now it's curable. I just want you to know that. She said, and we've also had women who have been pregnant who have gone through and successfully delivered a child. <sighs> she said, but we need to start urgently. This is acute. We don't have time. Because you often hear of those stories of women that are pregnant that find a diagnosis like this that have the choice, like do you want to put off treatment for a little while to deliver the baby and risk that? Yeah. But it sounds like you just it was you starting tomorrow. She mm -hmm. said this is this is aggressive. You've had this baby for the last two weeks and with like on your blood, she said everything else is fine, but she said like we can't wait. Do you know how it starts? Like how do, is it that you can just get leukaemia? Right, no. There's bad luck. It's cancer. It's bad luck. Yeah. yeah. Like shit happens. And so what was the treatment that they wanted you to start on straight away? Was it like a r radiation? Yeah, so straight away was you're pregnant, so we can treat you here but we're going to send you to Royal, like to the Prince of Wales Hospital and the reason for that is it's next door to the Royal Women's Hospital yep. and they said you're going to be in care for the baby but we're also going to be caring for you. So mm. you're going to be working alongside the haematology and oncology department and then you're going to be going to the maternal fetal medicine department at um, the Royal Hospital for Women. So um, they said <laughs> go home, pack your things, get your you know, notify your family, <laughs> tell your people you want to tell. And on Sunday night I had a bed in Sydney and they would just pour to me from the two hospitals mm. because they were right next door and I would have scans for the pregnancy and then I'd have a bone marrow biopsy for me and then I had a lumbar puncture straight away. They did spinal chemotherapy because I also had a cell that had flagged on my central nervous system mm, wow. that they thought maybe it had entered into there. And my first bag of platelets because 
they were dropping. Everything was happening very, very quickly. Look, I haven't been, I guess I've been terrified to share this part of the story and I've never shared it publicly. I've also only ever shared it with a very small group of friends and family members. So this is going to be a huge maybe shock to everybody. I don't know. But we had to do a medical termination. So it was a termination for medical reasons. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Our daughter was dying inside of me. Yeah. She, um, She stopped growing. I was 18 weeks gestation and she was the size of 15. And we had to do a medical termination for her because they said, if you don't, then you will both die. Yeah. Nikia, I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah. That's really. It wasn't a choice. And I, no. and I know, that, and this is a topic that is not spoken about. And that is why I'm sitting here so bravely and terrified to share. But it's not spoken about. And other women go through this. Mm-hmm. And other women have been through this. And I know that because. I have spoken to these women and they have shared that with me and it's not fair if we want to say that but it's life's not fair and life is hard and I am here today because of her and I'm here today because she saved my life. But it's also not a choice. It's not a choice. This is not getting to a point in a medical diagnosis where you go, oh, I'll make a decision. No. That's, that choice is taken away from yeah, you. Yeah, there was no um, choice in that at all. And there, yeah. there is not in the slightest. Like they said to me, they're like the chances of you surviving and her surviving, like it, the odds were like har- like harrowing. I did read something really beautiful that you wrote and you, I, won't, I don't want to say it, you can repeat mm. it, but just a, what you said just about how you truly believe that she was put here to save you. I do. I think her Explain time on that a earth. Bit. Yeah, I think her time on earth was so so empowering and I think that what she did in 18 weeks of her life was more than some do in an entire lifetime. And she saved me. I couldn't save her, but she saved me. Mm. And I remember sitting in that appointment like when they told me, when they first told me, and I said, like, I'm strong, my baby's strong, we'll get through this. I believed that wholeheartedly. I believed that. But when you're sitting there and you're having those scans, so I guess the bigger picture of it all is that I couldn't have delivered, because I was too early in my second trimester, I couldn't have made it to a safe because originally they were hoping to get me to 25 weeks, right? And it's like we can deliver at 25 weeks. Odds aren't great, but we can also do it. We're equipped to do that. I was too early. I had to start treatment. The treatment was happening. I didn't know this about leukaemia, but you end up having so many blood transfusions. Mm. And if you go into a spontaneous labour in the middle of treatment, you bleed to death. There's not enough transfusions that they can give you to clot your blood. You would both die. What was Dave's reaction? What was your husband's reaction at this point? We have to save you. Yeah. I can't lose you both. Well, there's no other outcome, is there? No. It's not even like let's see if we can save you both. No. If that was an option, maybe it would be a a more difficult decision, but it was 100%. There's – yeah. If you don't do this, you will die. Yeah. Did he, he have the role of trying to convince you at that point? No. You no. Were. He was like, this is you, your body. I am here wholeheartedly for whatever you need to do to survive. I am not losing the both of you. What a good man. No. The strength of him is incredible. How has it changed your relationship? What has happened with the two of you since this has all happened? Well, I'm going to say the word galvanised because <laughs> Laura always says that. <laughs> if you're playing Life Uncut, bingo. <laughs> Everybody take a drink. <laughs> uh, no, it, it, it galvanised us. <laughs> we shouldn't be laughing at that. but that was funny. It was funny. <laughs> I'll take it. We grew closer together. But I think IVF did that and a lot of people talk about this and I was like, everyone's like, oh, you're so strong and you're so this and I'll be like, yeah, but anyone that's gone through IVS is also – like they know mm. that. Anything in the world that is out of your control. But I think you underestimate how for some people it rips them apart. I mean it can do one of two things. Mm. For couples that are not good communicators or 
they're not able to support each other in the way that emotionally, mentally is required. Mm. It does the exact opposite. And so I don't think ever like never devalue how amazing it is when something that's a true trauma brings two people together. Yeah. Because that's that's like the biggest test in life mm, or in a relationship. Yeah. I mean, look, therapy. Yeah. <laughs> Let's be real. It's always there. <laughs> Therapy's always there. I've used it. <laughs> yeah. I'd be kidding myself if I, and lying to everybody if I said I hadn't worked through a lot of therapy. So I imagine at this time you've just lost your daughter Lexi but you don't even really have time to grieve because you need to continue on with your treatment to save your life. Yeah. So was there any process of, of saying goodbye and mourning that or yeah. was it just let's charge on and then I'll deal with it later It was on? grief in correlation. It was the two things at once. Mm. We had two days between treatment and losing her to go home before they then started more of my chemotherapy and... I was in hospital for 21 days at a time because you're so uh, neutropenic during leukemia treatment that you have no white blood cells. You're like wrapped in a bubble. So you're wrapped in a bubble. The whole ward was in lockdown yeah. even though COVID had finished and that's how you live. And I was in hospital for over 150 days wow. in total. I had five rounds of chemotherapy, two rounds of an immunotherapy, which was a very different experience on immunotherapy versus chemo, but and then I also went on in for a bone marrow transplant. And in amongst all of that, <laughs> which sounds wild, which happened from May to February of last year, I found out my sister wasn't a donor from the stem cell registry, that my donor was coming from, well, he or himself wasn't, but his stem cells were coming from Germany. Wow. Yeah, so I have a German donor. When you say that, you mean she wasn't a match? She wasn't a match. Yeah. Yeah, only one in four. So it's that rare in Australia here that you have to find a wait for an overseas match yeah. because just the not registry. enough people are donating. Yeah, there's not enough people on the bone marrow donor registry. That's wild. Yeah. And you have to be between the ages of 18 and 35 in Australia to be on the registry. So does that mean I can't? we can't donate? So you can donate your blood, your plasma, your pl like things like that, but the bone marrow donor registry, you have to be 18 to 35 to sign up. Wow. And then you remain on the donor registry until you're 60. But they will use a younger donor because the successes of the patient outcome is much greater. I didn't know that there was a time. I don't think anyone knows that there's a time limitation no. on this. So your donor, your stem cells come mm. from Germany. Yep. It's and a 30 year old male from Germany. Big Un shout out. Big shout because out. Because he saved your life. Unidentified to me, but yeah, he's yeah. over there somewhere. And then what happens? What's the process from then you have this life saving stem cells? Yeah. Once they do that transfer, is there a period of grace where it's like, let's see if you're in remission? Is it what's the percentage of guarantee that that works? So I'm in remission. I was in remission. Yay! Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I was in remission after my first cycle of chemotherapy. I was very fortunate. Chemo responded very, I responded very well to chemotherapy. So I actually went into remission after my first 21 day cycle. I had to continue though. That's the thing that people don't know about leukemia is although I was in remission, it could come back. So I had to continue my protocols correct until which was get the five stem cells. cycles until I had the stem cells right so I went into remission and then I went into st the stem cell transplant and in, and again back to the whole grieving thing like I'm in hospital 21 days at a time my husband had full-time access to come and see me but like only for the first cycle then after that it just went back to normal hospital stuff like visiting hours we were yeah isolated in the third cycle of chemotherapy they said to me look, like I am grieving. Like I can't tell you how much I am grieving my child and my daughter, Lexi, but they were like, this is your chance. You're about to go in for a stem cell transplant. If you want any chance of having future children, now is the time to do it. To do more embryos. To do mean? more embryos. Mm -hmm. So they said, you're in remission. We have enough time between the two cycles because normally you'd go only seven to ten days out as an outpatient before you'd go back in for your next. And they said, let's go so we can extend your time out of hospital. We can do four, three to four weeks here. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, <laughs> let's do it. Let's, what, like, this is the only chance we're ever going to have. Like, this it feels so messed up. This is so ridiculous. But, but let's now just do or it. Never. Now or never, right? Like, you take the shots. So we did and we were on six, we had one, we got one, M, well, sorry, we got one um, follicle grow and I woke up from that and said, is, it, is there anything there? And they said, yeah, there was an egg inside. And I was like, oh my God, 
like maybe this is the one. Like they say you only need one, you know. Anyway, an hour later they came and informed us that that was unsuccessful and had been too damaged by the chemotherapy. So we have no, like I've got no eggs. Mm. I'm in menopause right now. I, oh, Nikia. yeah, I, I'm in full blown menopause, HRT and all. And is that brought on by? The and treatment. it's brought on by treatment. It's brought on by the, st- the. I had for my stem cell transplant. I had chemotherapy, which was like the highest doses of chemo's that they can give you, plus total body radiation for three days, twice a day. Wow. So my my body's fried. My poor little ovaries are all <laughs> fried. Yeah. How do you <laughs> how do you deal with this when this is something that you so deeply wanted? Mm. What do you like? Where are you and Dave at? How do those conversations go down? And what do you do to preserve your just your mental, your well-being around the conversations of fertility. Yeah, it kind of in one way, knowing that we didn't get anything after that second collection during treatment. And again, I've actually not shared that publicly either. We felt as though that was, we could put a close on that chapter. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, there's other ways. And I think women these days discuss this with less judgment, but we have the option to donate eggs we have the option Mm. to get a donor egg or if I'm even ever in a position to carry right now I I wouldn't even be able able to do that because I am on medication still for my treatment so whilst ever I'm on that that's not even an option to me but in future maybe years down the track Mm. five years is can five years post stem cell transplant is when I'll be cured is what they call cured Uh, chances of relapse do occur during that time lots of people do go and have a second bone marrow transplant but I just choose to think that I will be one of the lucky ones. I can't imagine. And I have a like daughter. That's the other thing I think is important to remember. Like yeah. I have a daughter. She's not here, but I have a daughter. Yeah. I yeah. am a mum. Absolutely. And she's not here with us, but that doesn't change the fact that I have so much love for her and that I will forever, you know, be grateful. Be grateful for her. Nikki, something you said before we were properly were recording, you we're talking about the perspective that it's given you, that your appreciation for life, your appreciation for time, these lessons that you're like, some people don't ever learn them. They don't Mm. even ever get to the point where they're able to have a deep appreciation for just your own mortality. Mm. Where has that left you now in terms of how you view your life, what you want from your life, what you want from your relationships? Yeah. I think M. Kerry was actually a book I read during my Mm. treatment and she has a necklace or something even or even in her book there was a line that said if you can you must absolutely right it's beautiful it's such a good one and then Elodie Pullen again someone who's just been through such trauma she has another beautiful one and it's like if not with you then for you yeah. right like these things matter and these things are like these people have been through trauma themselves and they get it and it's not until you're in a position like this where you find strength that you just did not even know was humanly possible And also all the things that you think you want and that you think are the most important thing, like priority shift. It's hard to even imagine, but the the gratitude that comes from being like, oh, we get another chance at just living life that may not have been there a year ago. And I I will live for her. Like I will stand here and be absolutely terrified or sit here (laughs) and be absolutely terrified out of my, you know, (laughs) pants. But But I will do that because I will do that for her. And I want the world to know that she exists. I want other women to know that I see them. I want other women to know that they are not alone in anything that they're going through in life because, my God, I felt alone. Mm. I felt so alone and I wasn't. You should feel so proud of yourself though. I mean, oh. You've got me so many times. I'm <laughs> sorry. Don't, hey, don't you dare. I re- remember, and it's and it's what I went and said at the start. I remember reading your post in the discussion group, and it was how, in a time when you were going through so much, that you could still find so much positivity in wanting to help other people, and that shines through in everything you say. In the person that you are, you should be so proud of yourself for that. But also in the messaging now that you are advocating for this conversation around giving blood we don't hear it enough and and I'm thinking about my memories of like the the campaigns around give blood it's life-saving they kind of come in and they in ebbs and flows from like a marketing perspective from Mm. blood donor and blood drives but you never really hear it and how important it is on a personal human level how much that literally saved your life yeah can you talk us through 
why it is so important for people to give blood, why it is so important, especially from a certain age to even think about stem cells mm-hmm. and and the different things that you can do to help people beyond yourself. Sure. So I had over 55 blood products during my 150 days in treatment and I'm one girl. Mm. Yeah. I'm one woman. There are over 140,000 people living in Australia right now with blood cancers and they need blood. There's people in our discussion group who have it. There's people, mm. there's other lifers there's who are dealing with this lifers. right now. Shout out to Han. Yeah. yeah. I see you, I hear you, I love you. And yeah, we we are going through it and we need blood and I'm one person and I've had 55 blood products. So I just want that to be put into perspective. I think 34% of all blood products go to cancer patients And is when you say 55 blood products, if I went and donated blood, mm-hmm. is that one product? Is one donation one Yep, so we've product? got four components of our blood. We've got white cells which you obviously can't donate. (laughs) We've got red blood cells, we've got plasma and we've also got platelets and you can opt to donate platelets, plasma or blood, like red whole blood, haemoglobin, or in correlation, like cohesively, is to sign up to the Australian Bone Marrow Donor Registry, 18 to 35-year-olds. It's an at-home free cheek swab kit that you swipe your cheek and they get your DNA or you can also do it at the Australian Red Cross, a lifeblood centre, uh, where they will take a collection of blood from you and your blood stem cells will be tested and put onto a registry. And then if someone needs a stem cell transplant to save their life, like me, in terms of a long-term cure, then you will go on to be contacted. You can opt in or out. There is no, you know, you're not committed to it just because you're on the registry. Contacted if you're a match. Contacted if you're a match. And then it's a essentially a four-hour plasma, like equivalent to a four-hour plasma donation uh, where they collect the stem cells peripherally out of your arms and your blood and you return back to the gym the next day. And you literally just saved someone's <laughs> and life. And you've just saved someone's life. It took, me, it took me 11 minutes to receive those stem cells, but I was in hospital for over five weeks and then a 100-day isolation post Waiting. that. And 11 minutes later... Well, no, that, like that, 11 that minute was trans- after, yeah, 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 after an 11 minute transfusion. Yeah. But this, uh, this is the thing people don't know. People like, don't know. I never would have known that that was the thing. I no. didn't know that you needed to be signed up to this before the age of 35. And it feels like such a waste. It feels like such a. Because well, we had all these big ideas that we were going to go this week and sign up and do that. And I didn't know that you had to be under 35. I mean, yeah. I think it's such an important thing. If you are somebody who is under the age and you're able to, I mean, obviously giving blood is one step of that. And if you can do it consistently, please. But if that is something that you have the ability to sign up for, and then you can make the decision if that opportunity comes to you, I just, I think, I, I wonder why it hasn't or why it isn't more prolifically known. Like why yeah. people don't, why isn't that just common knowledge? I don't know. That's why I'm here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's what I want the world to know about. And yeah, there is no age limit on blood. And I think that's important to remember. Yeah. Like you can donate blood, I think up until the age of 75 and, or, you know, something like that. Like and that is what we hope everybody who's listening to this yeah. goes and does. Whether goes it's this week, next week, go in there this afternoon, Britt and I and the team, we're all going to go in and, and donate blood after this. Yeah. But we it's the perfect month too. It's it's world's greatest shave month. So mm-hmm. if Leukemia I mean foundation, exactly, world's greatest shave. Yeah, Leukemia yeah. Foundation. So not that you should need a month. Like we're going to encourage everybody to do it every month. But maybe this is the time. This is the kick that people need to be like, yep, it's the month. This is the episode. Your story. Thank you. We're all yeah. We're having a the, our team day out. We were going to go. We were going <laughs> to go to lunch and have drinks. And we're like, let's swap that. Our team day out now is going to be. Blood donation. Just make sure you're hydrated. Yeah. We'll, <laughs> we'll rehydrate afterwards and yeah. have a few glasses. <laughs> yeah. But beforehand we'll have water. Nikia, yeah. thank mm-hmm. you so much for everything. You are honestly, you're an incredible woman. Everything that you've been through, everything that you've experienced, we are so grateful for you sharing your story with us. We're so grateful for you being a part of the community and for how vulnerably you have been sharing throughout your journey as well. It has made and will make a huge difference to so many women out there who have been in your space or something similar and just feel immensely alone thank you yeah I I really hope so and yeah I mean I'm just like I said one small small town gal but I sure as hell Wollongong for the win baby (laughs) (laughs) yeah yeah you two connect on a whole nother level but even just in addition to what Laura said even just it's not lost on us that you shared some things today that you haven't told anyone Mm. yeah Um, so we feel really grateful 
that you feel like you can do that in this space yeah, and the I, fact that you felt like you could live your true life and tell your story in the Life Uncut discussion group yeah. is what I think Laura and I, well, I speak oh, for myself, but it's what we're most us. proud of in, is and, that, that community. Yeah, and the feedback I received. Like I, like I said, that was one of the most terrifying things I've ever done hidden post <laughs> on that story. Yeah, it's like where you post but and throw your phone away and you're like... <laughs> so much love and support like came through that page and mm-hmm. I felt so safe and I think what you two and Keisha have created here is something that is breaking barriers of stigma around women's health and things that we go through, fertility, you know, whatever that may be, like mental health, whatever. But like all of these things, it's you're breaking barriers and you're changing people's lives. And as I said at the beginning, you guys being vulnerable and sharing your story so confidently made me confident and brave enough to come on here today. No, to stop share it. My this story. is all you. This is nothing to do with us. <laughs> I, I mean that. But thank you. Yeah. So thank you. And guys, we love love. <laughs> <laughs>